Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Seth Nave, Extension Soybean Agronomist at the University of Minnesota, and welcome again to the Soybean Outlook Conferences uh, this November. I'm very excited to be here with you. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person uh, meeting and, and talking with you all. I miss I miss a lot of familiar faces this year, but um, I know that that's the case for a lot of us in our daily activities, so I understand. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going hit to hit this briefly and discuss uh, some of the quality aspects of the U.S. crop. Uh, here's an outline for our presentation just to give yourselves an idea of where we're at. We're going to talk a little bit about the weather uh, this year that farmers saw as they uh, produced their uh, soybean crop and then put it in the context of the historical variation that we see in protein and oil throughout the U.S. Uh, we're also going to discuss then the survey of the, the U.S. crop, the reason you're all here and watching. We're going to look at protein and oil, physical characteristics, the amino acids and the, and the sucrose in the soybeans. Um, the assumption, my assumption is that you all have a copy of um, the full report, the printed report uh, that's been translated for you. Please uh, take a look at that as we proceed through this video uh, or afterwards if you have more info, uh, want more information. Uh, there's a lot of detail in there. We don't have time to hit on everything. So most I'm going to be focused on the color maps that we present every year and we're going to go through those in some detail today. So here, just a little bit about the weather. Uh, we did have extreme weather events this year, so I think it's really important uh, to, to outline um, how those might have affected the soybean crop this year. This is a slide that I present every year. I don't change any of the text. Uh, this is exactly what we've seen in previous years, but it's important for you to understand the kind of high level uh, environmental impacts that uh, weather events have on, on protein and oil. It's important to remember that there's a lot of location specific uh, environmental impacts on soybean quality. So the, the latitude, the overall climate, the soil type, uh, and those long-term weather events. But there is annual variation in the weather pattern. So we're really talking about climate versus weather here. So the climate affects the long-term quality of the soybean crop. Uh, the weather impacts the year-to-year -year variation that we see. And most importantly is rainfall patterns. Uh, and really the most critical piece about rainfall is when we have too much water early, too much rainfall early in the growing season and too little rainfall and later in the season. Uh, this tends to be a recipe for lower protein in our crop. So it's very difficult to predict quality of a soybean crop uh, during the season. Uh, but we do know uh, from, from historical record and from a lot of experience that we've had running the survey that those events certainly are big, um, have a big impact on the soybean crop. A little bit about soybean production um, in the U.S. regarding the weather. Uh, we had record early planting in both Iowa and Minnesota in 2020. And we had early planting in Illinois, Indiana, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. So these six states produce more than 50% of the U.S. soybean crop annually, and, and certainly this year. Uh, so that early planting of those crops had a potential to really impact both the yield and the quality of, of the crop. And hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss a little bit more in detail about how that might have come to fruition this year. The challenge, though, is that we had really severe drought that centered in western Iowa uh, during the later part of the growing season, and it really extended across much of the Corn Belt. So right through the center of the Corn Belt this year, uh, we had a distinct drought um, that was quite severe, especially in western Iowa. Um, and so this, had a, this played a large role in reducing overall yields of the crop and affecting the quality of the crop as well. And I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the derecho. So this one was an extreme weather event where we had extreme winds that passed through the same area on August 10th of 2020, this summer. So there was winds in, in excess of 100 miles per hour across a wide range of Iowa into Illinois and Indiana. Uh, and it caused more than $7 billion in damage to crops and, and buildings and infrastructure in Iowa. Just a little uh, indication of a pictorial indication of the drought events that we had. You can see the highlighted uh, is a severe drought in western Iowa, and this is on August 11th. So this is actually the day, uh, essentially the day after that uh, derecho event went through this area. But you can see that we had a very uh, heavy drought in western Iowa, but, but there was drought that extended all through Iowa 
and there was a drought all the way into Ohio uh, of, this, of this past summer. As we moved into September, so this is only about three weeks later, we still see pretty significant drought. Now the extreme drought in Western Iowa receded just a little bit, uh, but the rest of the, the uh, Corn Belt uh, production area through the center of the uh, Corn Belt actually intensified slightly. So we had uh, a lingering drought across the, the soybean production area this year. And this is just a map showing the derecho event on an hourly uh, basis. You can see how quickly this uh, weather, heavy weather event marched across the Midwest. So hourly scans of, of this uh, cell as it moved across, you can see throughout the day, it moved all the way across uh, the, the Corn Belt. And Iowa, you can see the highlighted areas where it's very extreme um, weather, where we had heavy, heavy winds um, and significant damage. Let's talk just a little bit about the soybean crop. So first we have to look at the historical protein and oil variation to kind of put this whole thing into context. So we talk about this annually, but this is the previous 10 years of our survey. So if we lay all the data from 2010 through 2019 on top of, um, uh, of itself, you can see the variation in protein across the U.S. Uh, it's, it's important to note a couple things. One is that there is variation. If we look at the, uh, the index up on the upper right, you can see we have protein levels between around 33% protein on a 13% basis in those lighter green colored areas, all the way up to 35 or 36 in the darker uh, green colored in the, in the Eastern Corn Belt. You'll notice that there's kind of a Southeast to Northwest trend to this. Uh, but it's not perfect. Uh, there's a lot of areas that are highlighted within states. We often talk about state boundaries as being important for defining the quality of the crop, uh, but the environment isn't defined uh, by these geographical and artificial um, governmental boundaries that we play on our producers. Those areas are really highlighted because they have specific soil types, um, specific weather patterns, latitude, longitude, rainfall events, um, that you've probably heard me talk about at length in, in previous seminars. Uh, but it's important to note that there is variation, and, but typically we have higher protein in the south and in the east and lower protein in the north and the west. Oil, again, it's important to remember that oil is, uh, protein and oil are the largest portions of the soybean, so they make up more than 50% of the soybean seed itself. And uh, more so, they, they tend to balance each other, and partially because they, they uh, make up such a large portion of the seed themselves. As we increase protein, there has to be something that de decreases, and that's typically oil. We don't always get a one-to-one -one, um, uh, payback uh, for protein and oil, uh, but we do see an inverse relationship, and that can be shown in this figure. Um, those areas that were some of the lightest areas tended to uh, be the darker areas here where, where we have better oil concentration in areas where we have lower protein. But it's not a perfect relationship. If we sum these two variables, if we look at the sum of protein and oil shown in this figure, uh, you can see that um, we have lower protein and oil uh, levels in the north and the west and much higher in the south and the east. Uh, this is an indication simply that we have the amount of protein and oil in those soybeans, the sum of those co components doesn't always equal 54, 55 percent. Uh, that there is other residual factors in the seed, car complex carbohydrates and fibers that accumulate in soybeans in the north and the west. Going into the 2020 results specifically and the survey methods, um, as usual, we, we mailed out about 6,000 soybean uh, sample kits to farmers directly. Uh, and by August 28th, we received about 1,300. So 1,285 samples were returned to us. Farmers indicate their location and the variety uh, and, and provide some information on the growing season. And incidentally, many growers did mention that, that, the, that the year did start out too wet and ended too dry, which is again, our recipe for low protein in the US. For the most part, most of our analyses are through NIR, but we do a lot of manual uh, counting, seed weighing. Um, we, we take um, uh, seed size, moisture, uh, test weight by other instruments. 
but most of our quality measures that I'm going to talk about today are via NIR, so that because we have a, a quick turnaround on this study. So here's an overall result of the U.S. crop, and I don't want to burden you too much with this, the mean value of the U.S. crop. The U.S. producers uh, produce soybeans across a huge range of soybean production areas in the U.S. Uh, therefore, any mean value uh, doesn't really represent anything that any particular buyer will see. A, a soybean purchaser is not going to find an average soybean uh, for sale. They're going to differ significantly across the U.S., uh, but it does give us a little bit of an idea how the average crop looked relative to the previous years. So protein was down almost one percentage point from 19, 2019, uh, but oil incidentally increased by more than a point. So this is very, very unusual this year to have oil concentration increase by more than the decrease in protein. So we had more than a one-to-one -one payoff for oil relative to protein. Uh, you can see that we had... Um, a slightly larger increase or decrease in protein relative to the, the long-term 10-year uh, average. Um, likewise, we saw a larger than um, uh, the annual increase over the, the, the long-term average uh, for oil. So we were 1.6 points above for oil and 1.2 points below for protein. This is a new figure uh, for this year. I thought it was important to kind of characterize the both the the weight of the crop, um, how much production we have by each state, as well as uh, the overall protein and oil within each one of those states. And there's this is a very busy figure. And so uh, if you're watching this on video and have access to be able to pause this, you may want to spend a little bit of time going back to this. Uh, but what we're showing here is the diameter of those individual circles represents the overall production by state. So on the, you see a large number of circles that are over one another. That shows the grouping of the quality was all relatively similar across the Midwest. Um, the, um, the, uh, the blue circles represent the Eastern Corn Belt, and the magenta colors, the, the pink and purple, represent the Western Corn Belt. Uh, you can see Iowa and Illinois. Those are the two very large circles kind of in the upper left area uh, that are basically overlapping, almost identical protein and oil profiles for those two states. Relatively low protein this year, much below their usual protein levels, but very high in oil. If you move down to the lower right, you can see states like Minnesota, where I'm at, had higher protein level, but lower oil. And basically, in a one-to-one -one, uh, 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 fashion, those two were related to one another. I laid over the sum numbers here. So if we just sum the protein and oil, those lines represent 53 and 54. So the vast majority of the soybean crop had a sum of protein and oil between 53 and 54. And you can see kind of a rough um, um, correlation here between the protein and oil that basically follows that line. So a regression line would basically follow that that one to one line, meaning we got paid back basically one unit of oil for every one unit of, of uh, protein that we lost this year. So it does show that there is an advantage uh, for folks that are interested in purchasing high oil soybeans. Those will um, those have very good crush margins for for processors. Uh, there's a lot of oil yield within those soybeans, and and likewise. As we extract the, the oil from that soybean, uh, we actually concentrate the, uh, the protein concentration in the resulting meal. So we get two benefits uh, by increasing the oil concentration from a processing standpoint, and we can end up with very high quality meal um, as well. This is a map showing the variation about protein around the U.S. this year, uh, and protein differed significantly from the, the previous years. You can see we had a couple low areas in Iowa and Illinois, and this just relates to uh, weather events that we had. Again, these are areas that were probably too wet early and too dry later in the season. Uh, this really affected the overall protein level and probably drug down our yields in these areas as well, although we had relatively good yields considering the difficult conditions um, these uh, certainly these weather events probably played a factor and certainly reduced the protein level we will talk about this relative to the long term in just a little bit here's the oil concentration and you can see very high oil in the south and the east 
a little bit reduction towards the north and the west. So this is a little bit atypical for us as well, uh, but much more of a smooth pattern where we're mostly oil is related to temperature during seed fill rather than um, simply um, more due to a complex relationship between uh, nitrogen uptake during the season. And the Sama protein in oil, again, uh, we see the variation from south to north and uh, southeast to northwest, as I mentioned earlier. This figure shows the difference from the previous 10-year uh, history. So basically, we're laying this year's map that I just showed for protein relative to the 10-year historical figure that I showed early and show the relative differences. So it's important to take a look in the upper right at the... Um, at the legend and identify the colors and, and what those represent. The dark red are areas that are, you know, between 1.5 and 2.6, I believe, uh, percent protein decline year over the 10 year average. Whereas the, the yellow, the lightest color on this figure uh, shows areas of the US that did not differ at all in, in oil from the historic and protein from the historical. So again, the dark red, the hotter colors represent uh, areas that uh, decline the most, and the light yellow areas represent um, oil uh, protein that didn't differ at all from the historical. And if we look at oil concentration, uh, you can see the difference here. So this is quite a different story as, as we talked about from the means. We had generally an increase in, in oil concentration. And again, the yellow here, it's a little bit different color yellow, but the yellow here represents areas that did not really uh, change relative uh, to the previous. So about zero or slight increase, all the way up to two to three percentage points higher in places like Tennessee and, and Kentucky, and then the areas in Western Iowa as well with very high uh, oil concentrations relative to the previous year. And if we look at the, um, the protein plus oil, you can see that we generally saw an increase. So overall, protein plus oil, if you sum these two factors, we had more of these two valuable components in the seed this year uh, than we've had uh, in previous years. So generally, there is an overall increase in quality of the crop as we if we evaluate it by the, by the sum of protein and oil, which is how uh, a lot of the processors might see the soybean. So really briefly about the soil, the physical characteristics of the soybean, and I'm going to move through these very quickly. We had a quite a good harvest conditions across the western corn belt, and you can see soybeans came in quite dry, below 10% um, in, in the whole western part of the corn belt. In the eastern corn belt, we did see rainfall uh, late in the season that delayed some of the harvest, and soybeans came in there closer to 13%. So it depends on what individual buyers are looking for, but certainly in the Western Corn Belt, we'll have drier soybeans that'll provide a little bit greater um, meal and oil yields per ton. Uh, West Eastern Corn Belt um, soybeans might have a little bit better quality simply because they were harvested a little bit wetter um, and may not have as many splits um, and damage. Seed weight. This is a bit of an academic point, but I like to mention it every year. This is where we have uh, the environment improves at the end of the year. You can see that Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Ohio, a lot of Michigan actually had areas that may not have been perfect in the midseason, but they, the weather really improved towards the later part of the season. Those seeds really expanded and grew. These are areas that we saw yields increase more than what we may have expected during the middle season. So these are areas that probably surprised some of the traders in, in the positive sense. On the other hand, those lighter color areas are where we had very small seeds. So either the soybean was very optimistic in the midseason and just couldn't fill those seeds, uh, more likely this year, we just had a normal year and then the thing uh, things dried out towards the end and the seeds were smaller. Test weight is always a question that we get. It has really relatively little effect on overall quality of the soybean. It affects um, very little, um, uh, there's very little correlation with other important factors. Um, and there was uh, relatively little variation, uh, but as normal, we tended to see greater test weights or density of the crop uh, whole soybeans as we move to the north this year. And foreign material, uh, as always, foreign material at the farm level is very, very low. This year, the average was again 0.2% foreign material on average. 
Um, the only time we see an increase in this is because of a few individual samples uh, maybe have higher foreign material, uh, but those are tend to be scattered. Uh, over uh, out, of, out of nearly 1,300 samples, only 40 samples had FM above 1%. So again, more than uh, 1,250 samples had foreign material under 1%, if you look at the inverse of that. So very, very clean soybeans harvested uh, at the farm level. We're really interested in my lab and in, in understanding better measures of, of the value of soybean. We understand that trading soybeans based on test weight or, or just based on foreign material and some of the crude measures that we use to evaluate the crop probably don't do the best um, job of providing the full value of, of soybean to the end user. So we're looking for measures that really are, um, are more appropriate for valuing the crop. So what does a broiler chicken need in a soybean meal? Or what does a finishing swine? Or what does a layer, what does a, a starter piglet need in, in terms of, of a, a, a protein source to best optimize the performance of that animal and minimize the uh, input costs of those, uh, those producers. So that's one of the things that we're really interested in. We know that protein um, is, is measured by nitrogen uh, and nitrogen, uh, the animal doesn't need nitrogen. In fact, the animal doesn't need protein. It doesn't even need total amino acids. What the animal really is looking for is available amino acids. And yet we're, we're, we're measuring something that's about four steps removed and provides an index for the value of that crop. It's an efficient way of trading the crop, uh, but it does a really poor job of valuing uh, the crop as, as we move through um, the value system. So of course, one of the things that we're very interested in is amino acids. And as you've probably heard me talk before about amino acids, we tend to have a very strong trade-off between protein level and the quality of that protein. So quantity versus quantity. There's a strong trade-off in soybean from one versus the other. As we increase protein concentration in soybeans, the quality of that protein tends to decline. There's a dilution of the most important amino acids in soybean at higher protein levels. And in fact, my belief is really that soybean isn't an oil seed. It's not even a protein seed. Soybean itself is a nitrogen storing vessel. Soybean as a plant wants to store nitrogen. We've just coerced it to provide amino acids for our animals. And so those two, um, two focuses are a little bit disjointed and the soybean is trying to do something a little bit different than what we're trying to use it for and that's why we get this little bit of a of a of a, uh, of a fracture in how we look at the and value a soybean i will mention though that this year because we had such odd weather the very very high oil concentrations that we saw in soybean really played havoc with our general trends of of, of amino acids versus protein so this year you can see lysine as a percentage of 18 amino acids. So this is the relative abundance of lysine in the soybean crop. You can see that we have a tendency to have more lysine in the north and the west where we had lower protein. But that's the region where we tend to have normally have pro lower protein, but it wasn't necessarily where we had lower protein this year. The areas with some of the lowest protein concentrations this year did not have higher lysine concentrations. So the lysine, played out a little bit more like the historical rather than the, pre, than the current year. And we're trying to understand this a little bit better. Here we show the sum of lysine, methionine, cysteine, threonine, and tryptophan. These are the five most critical amino acids in soybeans for monogastric animals. Another interesting factor here is that we saw this was correlated more with total protein than lysine itself. Uh, and even though lysine is a big part of this five amino acid complex, there was little correlation between the sum of five and lysine itself. So these other amino acids really played a role, cysteine, methionine uh, likely, as well as threonine, uh, probably played a large role in, in, in the quality variation this year. So it just shows us this amino acid variation question, the quality, the protein quality versus quantity question is very complex. We've done some research that, that supports some of the things that we're seeing this year. Um, but we, we, it shows that we just have a lot more work to do to understand what's driving these amino acid uh, deposition in soybean seed. 
Lastly, I just want to mention soybean quality in terms of, of complex carbohydrates, especially soluble sugars. And today I'm just going to focus on sucrose. A couple factors with sucrose that are really important for us is that sucrose variation um, is uh, the variation in, in quantity is quite large. As you can see in the upper right hand corner again, if we look at the percentage of the seed on a dry matter basis, soybeans are this year from three to five or six percent protein in the seed. So that makes up a large portion of that residual fraction in soybean. And this is also concentrated in the meal. So as we remove oil uh, from the whole soybeans, the sucrose is concentrated and these, these numbers expand and the range of those numbers expands. So it shows us that there's a tremendous amount of sucrose in the seed and there's a, uh, in the soybean seed and in the meal. And there's, there's tremendous variation out there. So um, as traders, we need to, and purchasers and end users, um, you know, even suppliers, we need to know what's in that soybean and that soybean meal uh, so that we can better value that meal as it moves through because we understand that that sucrose has a tremendous value to the animal in terms of a, an available energy source, readily available energy source. And for the most part, most feeders are using soybean um, meal book values for the, the, the metabolizable energy contribution of that meal. Uh, but we know that there's significant variation. So it's time that we become a little bit more sophisticated and evaluate our, our soybeans, our meal, and our feeds uh, um, in, in that same sort of a manner. With that, I'd like to finish up and, and thank you all for your attention. Uh, again, I would have loved to have been there and, and talk to you in person today, uh, but it's, it's a pleasure to be able to present uh, the quality of the 2020 soybean crop. And as usual, you reach out to your uh, regional USEC office or contact me directly. I'd be happy to speak with you uh, or email or Zoom with you about soybean crop at any time. Thank you very much.